Welcome everyone. Uh, today is March 25th, 2020. I'm Dr. Terry Hildebrandt, the uh, Director of Evidence-Based Coaching at the Fielding Graduate University. And we're excited today to have a panel of experts and Fielding alumni who are gonna be talking about coaching managers to lead virtual teams and remote employees. Uh, this is part of our Evidence-Based Coaching Professional Series webinars, which we do at least twice uh, or even three times a month. Uh, to share useful information uh, that folks uh, may be interested in, including uh, uh, today uh, practical information around coaching and leadership. Uh, we also share research in our thought leaders webinars, and we'll be doing uh, talking about more of those at the end of today's meeting. Uh, we have three uh, uh, folks that are very excited to be part of this panel, uh, Kevin Sewell and Sherry Bowles-Gibbons and Marianne Spatola, uh, again, all Fielding alumni, and I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves briefly as we begin this process. And the first question to kick off this panel is, tell us about your journey of working with and leading and managing virtual teams. So why don't we kick off with Mary Ann? That's what I get for having my mic off, right? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, and thanks for having me, Terry. It's really exciting to be part of this panel um, and looking forward to the conversation today because as we all can acknowledge, this is an unprecedented period of remote working. It's the first time in history, I've described it as the largest working remote exper uh, experiment that we have ever embarked on in history. And we find ourselves thrust into this world some unwillingly, it's been mandated, and others who welcome it. Um, so I personally have worked in large organizations where a third of our employee base worked remotely from their homes. Um, so I've been inside organizations where we lived and breathed that. Um, we taught our managers how to lead teams in the virtual space. Um, I've had virtual teams myself. And we've embedded it into leadership programs to build that capability into the organization. So it's been a fun experience. Uh, hopefully I have some nice practical tips to share with uh, the rest of the panel today. Great, excellent. Thank you, Marianne. Let's hear from Kevin. So I um, feel very similar to Marianne. Uh, it's, it's, it's a type of change. And a lot of times it, when change comes from crisis, it makes it even more challenging. But um, I have worked as a virtual team member probably over 10 years. So I work for a company that uh, we implemented about 10 years ago, something called Smart Stack, which it means that we're eliminating floors and we have to put together another initiative called Smart Work to teach people how to work remotely. So that's been exciting. Um, my previous job, which I had for about 12 years, uh, four to five days I worked sometimes from home, other weeks, two or three, but it was quite often and had to lead teams from a distance. So, project teams. Yeah. All right, thank you, Kevin. Sherry. Hello, everybody. Uh, similar to uh, Marianne and Kevin, I've had a professional background where uh, I first started as a, a field sales rep for Merck Sharp and Dome and Pharmaceuticals with the home office. And uh, so as an employee, I had a lots of experience uh, from that uh, position, observing both good and bad and productive and unproductive behavior uh, from that perspective, uh, all the way to uh, growing up in various different functions. I was head of development for Warner Brothers in international television co-productions, where we would have post-production in Paris, and we would be fil filming in Lithuania, and the writers would be in Los Angeles. So we had six uh, different countries at various times on various projects. Uh, so clearly that's remote working versus necessarily virtual. Uh, but then I do have clients now uh, in the virtual space, uh, you know, having to manage this new uh, dramatic change all of a sudden you know, getting everybody online. So soup to nuts. Uh, I think we can answer a lot of the questions that I'm sure your uh, clients are experiencing. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. All right, our next question is, what are some of the biggest challenges that managers face when transitioning from on-site or co-located teams to virtual teams? And who would like to start? 
Uh, I can. Great. Thanks, so, Kevin. I think one of the biggest things in this situation is definitely shock. I think um, people don't know where to start. So I think it's considering where your people are emotionally. I feel like, um, you know, the the model for grieving may be part of it where people are pushing the anger away right now and just experiencing high anxiety. But from a, from a practical perspective, um, it's really, the challenge is usually technology, uh, whether or not your organization can support so many people working from home. Um, I hear all the time about VPN issues, um, whether or not they have high speed internet that can be effective for moving large files or working from a SharePoint site. And then the other thing is, I think the biggest challenge is there aren't standardized processes typically uh, versus, you know, standardized operational processes going from the office to home. So then people don't know how to manage their people. They're used to maybe managing the people with time mm -hmm. and their presence versus actual productivity metrics and um, goals. So I think that's, that's going to, that's, those are pretty much the biggest challenges we've been facing and what I've experienced. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, I would agree. Um, he, he, Kevin hit on the three main buckets that I wanted to highlight. There's a technical component. Do they even know how to work it themselves? Um, there's an operational component. Uh, and in times like this, where it's unprecedented and sometimes unwanted, it's even more important to establish routine, standards, operating procedures, ways for people to stay connected. And the third piece is emotionally. Um, and I guess the biggest mistake I've seen so far with clients who are trying to transition into this world successfully for themselves and for their teams is they skip that emotional part. And they try and dive mm -hmm. right into the technical and the operational pieces without addressing uh, the frustration, the anger. Um, and in some cases, you know, I have folks who are in isolation. Um, you know, they're alone, they don't, they, you know, they feel trapped. Um, and all of those emotional triggers will play into the effectiveness of how they lead their teams, particularly in this environment. Okay, thanks, Marianne. Absolutely. Yeah. And building, building on that, I think that's one of the, the key things for clients that you have that are leaders. Anxiety and fear is contagious, and mm -hmm. this is a very tough environment. And so uh, strategies to actually manage those pieces so that that isn't communicated to the team, and what does that conversation look like? Uh, so so um, not only do we have the tactical and technical things, we have the leadership issues, which generally will also feed into the cultural conversation that Marianne was pointing out earlier before some of you are arrived because uh, all of the cracks in the armor are going to show and they're going to mm -hmm. show really quickly and mm -hmm. and then there's the process issues of you know um, uh, communication has to change and the structure about the communication has to change and the clarity about the expectations and then and then there's the individual employees some of them may thrive in this environment some of them may be so um, discombobulated uh, and isolated if they're extroverts that they will really, really struggle. So it's uh, a, a very, you know, that's not a one size fits all process, um, particularly from the manager's perspective. I, I think uh, very, very high touch communication to know where everybody is so that they could uh, uh, apply additional support where needed and 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 know that they're comfortable with other employees who are actually doing really well and so they could pull back the throttle micromanagement is not the answer here no oh gosh no nope and sherry brought up a great point that that's one of the things we are building into our process now is all these consistent communications our daily check-ins and so forth and it, at first it was misinterpreted misinterpreted as is this a trust issue they do they trust not trust that we're going to actually do the work and it really wasn't it was more to update this is what's coming coming from the government our incident mm -hmm. control center those kinds of things but immediately people were like why do we have to check in every day do they do they not think we're going to accomplish mm -hmm. what we need so yeah, i think totally. this in communication and and that clarity but also building that trust that's really important which may have not been there when they were in the office yeah, great point <laughs> And so people really, really can be really thrown off by that. Yeah. And I think to the intent behind this webinar, Terry, that when you pulled us together was to talk about how coaching can be valuable yeah. in these circumstances. And here it is. 
right? So not only do they have to take self-care, but caring for their teams who are going to need the coaching moments Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. help them work through the challenges they're facing to be effective. You know, we have one end of the spectrum where people may feel isolation. The other end of the spectrum that I'm seeing a lot of my clients and they're losing their minds is everybody's working from home. My spouse, my children are learning from home. I have two dogs and a cat. They want my attention as soon as I get on the phone. How do you manage all of those things? And that's where coaching can play a tremendous role and add a lot of value to helping making this situation work. Absolutely. It's funny you just said that because my Frenchie was right here when this started wanting attention. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So it's so true, right? Even I'm dealing with that myself. So I could appreciate Mm -hmm. that. Excellent. Well, you've already started the answer to answer the this third question, but let's let's continue the dialogue. What do you think are the best practices for leading and managing virtual teams and remote employees? If you were going to give advice, um, and I know we don't normally give advice, but you know, at this point, you know, as coaches, we are uh, providing best practices and, and some tools for our our uh, the folks that we work with. And so, what might be some of those that you would recommend? I would start off with, oh, go ahead. Oh, it's sure, okay. you know oh no, I, I would say that any situation where you're going into this new, the first thing is always a readiness assessment, but we can't do that. Uh, we're thrown into it. I, I thought we've, a lot of us found out last week when we're working from home. So as a manager and a leader, I would immediately do a needs assessment, kind of figure out what are our knowledge and skills and abilities gaps, our KSAs, technology, and then also our, our physical ergonomic needs. That would probably be the first step for me. I think that um, once you can determine those people who are highly extroverted and need to be contacted more and need to have more maybe virtual coffees and one-on-ones versus people who are going to thrive just as natural part of who they are. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm an extrovert, by the way, so it's not a negative. <laughs> I'm just saying that I have suffered a little bit of that. I need to talk to someone. I'm going to go to Starbucks, stand six feet away, and yell at the barista. So <laughs> and I don't think that's I don't think that's okay. So <laughs> so I, and then um, of course. As uh, Marianne and Sherry already talked about, it's developing these norms around standardized processes and metrics. But I think one thing that really helps, and I just thought of this the other day, is normalization, is keeping things normal. Keep your regular meetings, keep your one-on-one, keep training going, um, even if it's something around, uh, maybe a topic that's not super exciting to people, but we deliver a lot of training and I'm not canceling anything. Like, no, we're still going to attend. It gives them a sense of normalcy and routine. Yeah, totally. I, I would that, totally agree with that. Um, yeah. One of the things I would say, uh, in addition to build on what Kevin just offered, um, in addition to that routine is having prioritization around what people need to focus on. We still have goals. We still have a job to do helping people stay focused on where those priorities are, I think is part of it. You know, if we think about this in terms of change principles, the lightning rod is the response to the virus and everybody's gone remote and people will naturally try to refreeze, right? So we had the unfreeze with the lightning rod. The natural human behavior is to try and refreeze. How do I reestablish myself to feel stable and you know, get back in the routine. So I think that's a really important point. The only other kind of tactical piece I would offer, because I've seen um, leaders and team members make this mistake, is when they're setting up their home space and they're getting their work environment ready, you have to treat it as if it is your workspace, not just propping up a laptop somewhere, but making sure you have the necessary supplies, connection, connectivity, lighting, And I always say, turn your camera on and see what they will see. (laughs) Don't get yourself in trouble. Make sure that that's what you want them to see. And if not, clear up your space, figure out where you need to be. And for some people, that can be challenging. Um, But it is a, a trap that people don't recognize right away if you're not used to this environment, that um, you can expose things you may not want to. Yeah. That's an excellent point. And, and I think uh, one of my clients, and I think this is brilliant, uh, has a rule that you can't turn off your camera mm-hmm. un- unless, you know, you're, you're literally having a, a bandwidth issue or technical issue and they've got it wired so nobody can claim that, it, it, you know, it, um, excuse for very long. Yeah. Uh, and, and that sort of um, 
face-to-face -face contact con um, tact in this context is super critical mm -hmm. because we don't know if somebody's having a bad day and to take that email tone you know with a grain of salt because you know, they just got some bad news, which normally we would overhear and we would know if we were sitting next to them at the office. Yep, absolutely that's, right. That's a critical thing, I think, right now. And it's very simple, very tactical, but it has a, a tremendous amount of impact. I have clients who are doing, uh, in addition to your virtual cup of coffee, Kevin, they're doing virtual happy hour. Bring your beverage, favorite beverage, let's get online <laughs> at 5.30 and just talk. Just be together. I want to see each other. One of my clients um, is an HR manager. She has teams in Asia Pack. They've been sequestered for seven weeks. Wow. Mm. Wow. They're really struggling because they were a very close team. So they get on and they do virtual cup of coffee in the morning. Twice a week, they're doing virtual happy hour. Bring your favorite beverage and let's just talk. Nice. See one another. How are we feeling? How are we doing? How can we support each other? Yeah. Oh, wonderful. And I, one last thing about what Marianne said about creating your workspace, I would also communicate those work boundaries to your family. Yes. So a lot of times, you know, I, I, you know the infamous uh, YouTube video of, I think it's an ambassador, someone, and their little kids come in, <laughs> sneak through the door, the nanny runs in and grabs them and pulls them out and walks. I mean, the whole thing is, is a lot of times we have to communicate with our families as well and say, hey, from this time to this time, you know, and I have a coworker that puts a little post-it on the door so the kids know when they can come into the office and knock and when they can't. So just make sure that your family understands and, and then the fact that it's not that they, you don't want to pay attention, it's just that you also need to get work done too. So Yeah, that's a great point. I have a client who just went through that issue and what they did was they had a family meeting. She's working Perfect. from home, her husband's working from home. She has two um, elementary school age children and they're dividing up duties, dividing up times, who's going to be in what room when, and who's going to manage it. And yep. it, it, they pulled together a really effective plan to kind of share the load, make sure that everybody could have the best experience they can have, given the situation and the environment that they're in. Great. Thank you. Great. One, one question that I had from a coaching client yesterday that I was meeting with was, how do I get my team to turn on their video? Uh, and there are a lot of engineers that are working in Silicon Valley, introverts, uh, don't like to speak on shared calls um, to begin with, you know, conference calls. And uh, turning on video is a new thing for their culture. Uh, so any, any suggestions uh, that any of you have for that? Well, is there a dialogue around uh, with the team, as a team, about that and the benefits versus the resistance? So that's what I recommended <laughs> that they do this talk about why video is important now where maybe when you're normally face to face and see each other daily. But I, I would love to hear any other ideas you guys have as well. Uh, well that, for those who for those who do have anxiety around being on video, I would still take a moment to kind of coach them on and help them discover what makes them pause about being on video and uh, maybe help them work through that individually versus um, saying that you have to because I think that's the tough part it's when you know it's when it feels like micromanagement when there feels like there's a little bit of exertion of power when they and they don't understand so I think it would still come down to the individual and helping them work through their own internal process mm -hmm. so that what a great coaching question right you know what's yeah. coming up for you when yeah, and not exactly. turning on video yeah what a great yeah. coaching question in my uh, mm -hmm. I have two classes that I'm teaching so I'm an adjunct at NYU in Columbia and my wow. in-person residential classes have all been moved online and we had the same issues there you know students don't like to be on camera either and so we made an agreement so we had that conversation last night to talk about the value of seeing one another and checking in especially in the beginning you know when I, I just wanted to see how everybody was doing so what we agreed to was we would check in visually with the cameras three times during our class at our beginning, when we come back from break, and before we close. And so it was a nice happy medium for the ones who don't want to be on all the time, but it was still an opportunity to see a smiling face, ask a few questions to see how you're doing. And then I do think the technology gives us other uh, features that allow for the interactivity, like we did a bunch of polls 
mm-hmm. um, just to see how they're feeling. And so, for, again, for the people who don't like the camera, they also don't often like to be called out, yep. or put on the spot. And so the polling feature allows them to participate um, and allows them to see the results collectively. And then we can talk about how we're doing as a group, as mm-hmm. opposed to calling any individual out who may be not feeling sure. so great. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we, we did have, uh, well, there's a number of questions in the chat room and just want to acknowledge those and we're going to be getting to all those in a moment. Uh, but I did have one more question. How can coaching help leaders make this transition from face-to-face to virtual? So I'll offer my thoughts on this one. I think Kevin hit this one right on the head before. And there are, unfortunately, too many managers who still have old mental models about remote work and old mental models about management. Mm-hmm. And we've, each of us has called out the notion of micromanaging and control is really not going to work. It never worked even in the workplace. No, <laughs> but it, it didn't work it, before. <laughs> yeah, it never worked before. And it's going to be even less effective now. Right. And I think the biggest opportunity for coaching is at the senior most levels in our organization to help them shift that mindset. You know, while this is a tremendous um, an awful, horrific situation we find ourselves in, it can be an absolutely phenomenal opportunity to shatter the mental models that have prevented us from using this technology and using remote work effectively as another way to get work done. Reach broader audiences, give employees more freedom, let them do what they do best. Mm and start that fire. I mean, I would love Mm -hmm. to see that as an outcome, but I really do believe we have to work with the senior most leaders in organizations who are still in those old mental models and help coach them through what this change can really do for companies. Yeah. I love, I love what you said. And I think it gets to the root of the culture of leadership. I think um, one of the, one of the things I've gotten to do at my company is start a little intentional culture workshop for some, of my, uh, well, for my senior leader and his directors. And, and the thing that comes up is what drives it is really what's at, I think the real question is what drives people to micromanage and drives people to have more control. And I think with coaching, it's such a great, it's such, I think it's the best tool to help leaders figure out, you know, what, why, why do I actually think this way? Not why, that's a terrible coaching question for anyone out there. It's not a, it's never a why, it's never but a we why. know what you meant. <laughs> but you know what I meant, you know what I meant. Yes. But uh, essentially, it's really thinking about, well, what, what makes you believe that? What causes you to believe that? Or, and, and a lot of times, it's just, it's always been that way. You know, um, the company mm-hmm. I work for, great company it's 150 years old and um you know we have our set culture and 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 it's always hard to shift culture in even startups but it's even harder in an established organization and uh i feel like the coaching is so powerful but it helps them work through their own questions of well did it work for you how did micromanagement affect you did control for you so go ahead no like you kevin i like to unpack what's underneath it all. And when it comes Mm -hmm. to this world of remote, what I find with a lot of leaders is it's the inability to control. Mm -hmm. And that's the really rich, powerful leadership attribute I unpack with them. Yeah. Is it about the control that gives you this false sense of security (laughs) about what's going on? And what could you choose instead? Could you choose a trust-based culture? Right. Could you use a different leadership model? Like transformational models, fantastic. I'll pitch that. Absolutely. You know, I mean, there's there's a lot of I mean, a lot of times people don't feel like it's an option because they in their arena that's all they know, and that's mm-hmm. probably what's pervasive. Yeah, so. and it, it's the vulnerability of not knowing what what the outcomes will be here. Like I said, it's the largest experiment in history. Yeah, but it's here, right? It you know, it's the gift of acceptance. This is where we are. Let's try and figure it out. Absolutely. And as coaches, uh, the gift that you can provide uh, to your clients who are leaders in this context, all bets are off. We have no idea where things are going to go. Yeah, And that we're all in it together. And a lot of people are moving so fast that all they're looking at is 
getting through today or this week or the two weeks or now it might be Easter uh, but the space that we can create for those leaders to start thinking beyond you know where this is heading uh, and how this isn't going to impact our economy, our businesses, our industries. Uh, there's great opportunities that are going to be coming from this mess, uh, and yep. and you know significant shifts. And so uh, the coaching space is a, a great place for these leaders to, to to slow down enough to start to think about that. Mm -hmm. When when perhaps left to their own devices, they're they're not because yeah. they're moving too fast to keep up. Okay. And like Sherry and I were talking about before we got started, you know, go back to the change principles. I think the mm -hmm. biggest tragedy coming out of this is we revert to the old ways. Yeah. That we don't learn from this, that we don't take the opportunity to apply it and really bring some new innovation about how we get things done. I was sharing with uh, Sherry when we were chatting, there was a great article in Entrepreneur Magazine earlier this week. And they were talking about this huge push to remote working and the, the havoc it's wreaking on businesses and organizations around the world. But his closing quote went something like, uh, the way businesses will compete in the future has been irrevocably changed. Mm -hmm. mm. And that really resonated with me. And I think this is one portion of it where I hope we don't slide backwards. You know, we yeah. find some new normal that accepts this work practice and allows for the things we thought couldn't exist. Excellent. So I have one last question, then we're going to open it up. Go ahead, Kevin, you have another comment. Yeah, the only thing I also wanted to add was in the change world, as you guys know, the most effective triggers of change is pain. And a lot of times people won't change unless there is pain. So especially from the higher sponsorship levels, like executive, director, manager, a lot of times, they won't see a need unless they feel something and, and they're uncomfortable. And this crisis has caused that. Yep. And I think it is a true opportunity to see how people are going to respond to it. Because it's a lot of crises, you know, come some of the best ideas, the best models, the best solutions. And I'm just hoping that, like Marianne and Sherry said, that we do capitalize on it. So Wonderful. So how, what advice do you, all of you have for coaches? This is addressing coaches who are working with leaders to make this transition. How, how, what support or thoughts do you have for them? The first thing that, that uh, I was surprised by with one of my uh, CEOs that I was talking to yesterday is nobody had asked him that what he needed. Uh, and, you know, clearly as a coach, that's the first thing that comes out of our mouth practically. Uh, but it was in the context of uh, I coach the entire team as well as as him, uh, and and it was just shocking to me the 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 pause that happened when I asked him that question because he hadn't even thought about that himself. He hadn't had the time. So uh, the the self care and 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 the you know helping our leaders pause and slow down long enough to figure out the priorities in the situation, I think is a tremendous gift that we can do for our clients. Yeah, the big thing for me has been helping them unpack the emotional side mm. and the barriers that um, they just tend to see before they see the opportunity. And helping them realize that, you know, you know, to Kevin's point, this is it. It's here. <laughs> we are all in a world of hurt and we're trying to figure out how to make this work um, and getting them through, you know, the vulnerability of it, the ambiguity of it, um, and helping them really step into their leadership role has been a big mm -hmm. part of that, particularly the ones who were not tech savvy. And so there's a lot of anxiety about how am I supposed to lead a team when I don't even know, you know, how to do this. Um, right. and never wanted to do it. They really never had an interest in doing it. And they find themselves in this world and they have to make their way through it. So m most often it's, a, it's unpacking that emotional side first. And then we can get to the technical and the operational pieces. And that flows much easier when they're in, a, in the right frame of mind. 
Yeah, and I would, the last thing, I mean, I would add on to the emotional side, because I love that part. I love unpacking the emotional side of things. And then also the, any perceptions that are attached to it that may not be true. Yeah. I, I think a lot of times uh, people feel things, but they don't know how they, you know, how they internalize it, what messages come from it, the perceptions that surface from it. And I think helping them see those and determine actually if they're true or not is really helpful. And if, and give them, you know, ask them questions that force them to make, not force, make force, uh, that encourage them to make a choice, mm -hmm. you know, that encourage them to make a different choice. So I think that's important. Great. Thank you all. So let's go to the audience. We have a lot of great dialogue happening in the chat room. Uh, and I'd like to start with uh, a question that came in very early. Does Do remote um, and virtual team building initiatives work um, for companies and organizations that need to keep teams aligned, motivated, and productive? Absolutely. Absolutely. Any best practices the there? How, how might you approach that, Sherry? Because a lot of leaders and even coaches are not doing remote team building. So I think this might be a really good opportunity to share a couple of thoughts on that. Well, I think there's this idea that, uh, like Marianne was saying, that, you know, that remote or virtual doesn't count. Um, and yes, I, you know, if, if, if I have a client that I do in, you know, I do retreats, you know, I'm like in-house coach, so to speak, even though I'm, I'm not. Um, so we do in person, we do retreats, uh, we do um, virtual team stuff. Um, I, I think if, if you were to choose, you would at a minimum want to balance in person with virtual. You know, e even at Warner Brothers, you know, we would fly to France, you know, just to check in. I mean, you can't do that all the time, um, but you do it enough to build <clears throat> up that face to face. In this environment, we can't do that, but that there's no reason why. Uh, a team building session on virtual is um, not doable. I mean, yes, you know, you, you can't physically, um, you know, uh, have one of those exercises where, you know, we're, we're building blocks together or whatever that exercise is, but there's all sorts mm -hmm. of intellectual team bu building exercises or, or, you know, gamified word exercises or you know tools that we can bring into play in a in a virtual team environment. It's just a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Kevin. Oh, I was going to say that I have to run virtual classes all the time. So tools like Zoom or Adobe Connect are really helpful because polling is fantastic. I yeah. love polling is a great tool. And most of these have whiteboarding um, functionality. So even tomorrow, I am taking a PowerPoint, opening it. I'm pulling this little pen from my laptop. And then we're just going to share the screen. All they'll see is a whiteboard. And we're going to do all our whiteboarding virtually. And then it's easy to just grab things, move it to the right, erase, and then start over. And then have the, have someone else facilitate. My my practical is have a producer. Have someone who's technically astute, who's running these kind of whiteboards and activities, gamification of activities, um, who, who's uh, maybe it's someone on your team who can be like a, a reverse mentor to you technology-wise. I love doing that too. Uh, and then that way the facilitator can truly facilitate it. I find that it's complicated sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, to be the one doing all the work and then having to try to lead a virtual team and look everyone on the camera and then to respond to the chats. But your producer is the one who does the chat and the one that does the technology and follows your lead. And for every activity that you want to do, you can probably develop a virtual equivalent. Absolutely. So for instance, whiteboarding is very popular. You, that's fairly easy to do on technology. Uh, maybe, it's, um, <clears throat> maybe it's a team building activity like the artifact, which is when everyone brings something that's meaningful from home for, the, for mm -hmm. them and they talk about it. And that can easily be, hey, let's look at this, the camera, this is why it's important. We help that connection. And that's the time that your cameras would be on. So there is a way to virtualize or to gamify almost any activity and do it online. Um, if you've ever taken a Franklin Covey class online, like Seven Habits, they run the full six hours mm -hmm. and, and it's very well done. Yeah. And you just give them long breaks, yeah. 15 minute that's breaks, right. half hour break one hour lunch and it's it's pretty effective yeah so anyway i would echo I all, that of, a lot. all of that um and just add that um this is one of the orthodoxies we have to break 
So the fact that we believe you can't do team building in a virtual space is our biggest barrier. I would approach it just like you would any other team building. All the things that Sherry and Kevin just shared are the same things you would do if you were planning that meeting in person. You're going to plan out your questions. You're going to plan out your activities. You're going to have a scribe, right? And when I'm yep. facilitating, I always have somebody else on the flip chart doing the scribe work, right? So that you can <laughs> facilitate and focus on what's going on. The other feature I would add that is tremendously effective is the breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. So you can, and sometimes even more effective than when you, you know, you have different space because they run around the building, you can't find people. <laughs> um, <laughs> nobody comes back when you let them roam around the building. Uh -huh. So here they are in a breakout room. You can have the same uh, effective way to build uh, a team to do, you know, very personal activities. I personally run a virtual leadership program. We're developing leaders on a digital platform. And they have very intimate coaching conversations. I break them into pairs. They practice coaching each other. They come back. Um, and we debrief how that went. So it is possible. We just have to make sure that we adapt to what the technology can offer and mm -hmm. make it happen. Great. Yeah, you know, that's a great point. Some of them are actually kind of tough. I had a, a recent workshop that I did for my leaders that it was called the brick activity. So we came up with all these issues and possible derailers and obstacles. And we physically built a wall with these bricks. I had them write them on a sharp mm -hmm. with a sharpie and, and one person was virtual. Yeah. So and uh, and they had to be off site. So we wired them in. They heard the whole process, and it was as simple as sharing the wall being built and what people were writing, and it, they still made the connection, which was really really great. Yeah. Here's one other thing I would offer, and this is kind of um, contrary to what we've been led to believe about the virtual setting. My experience has been, people are actually more willing to be open, vulnerable, and share in this. And for whatever reason, it's kind of like when you talk to somebody on the phone, it's easier because maybe you don't have to see them or you're just not sitting next to them. Sure. But, but people will put themselves out there. People are willing to, you know, be a little bit vulnerable, talk about the tough issues, and you can still get things done. Yeah, it's kind of like... It's kind of like therapy, where you go to your own office far away, and you're not in your saturating your current surroundings, and then you get online with someone, and they're not a part of that world. Right. So I think you're right. It makes people feel a bit safer. Yeah. It's almost like putting them in a cocoon. Mm -hmm. You know. So let's let's move on to a couple other questions. And uh, Chris, would you like to ask your question about children? If you if so, go ahead and unmute yourself and come online. Children are great. I think you should have them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Okay. Well, I heard they're expensive. So. They are expensive. <laughs> All right. And it looks never like, ends. It looks like Chris is having a little trouble. I'll go ahead and read the question. So a challenge that is unique to our environment is the fact that there are young children at home. How can we address the balance between meeting and mental presence along with young children who haven't uh, don't have the capability to understand direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Practices. I had, yeah, I had a client with that issue, and essentially, uh, they were taking, they were working their work schedules around each right. other, and essentially trading off who was on point with yeah. the kids. That's what my client did too. Nice, good idea. Uh, mm -hmm. Here's another one. What happens when there are several individuals working from home? with limited space. I had this happen this week as well, it come up uh, with one of my clients. Suggestions on limited space, especially around ergonomic issues, perhaps, um, and privacy. Um, my clients mm -hmm. particularly uh, was having very confidential conversations They're, you know, with high privacy issues. H how do you manage that when you've got a lot of people in a very similar close, close space? Oh, people are getting really creative. I had one client yeah, literally go to her walk-in closet and lock the door. Mm. And the bathroom. Yeah. Yep. And, yeah, I had a friend who has a spare bathroom, and he built a table over the sink and made it a stand-up work, work, work uh, station, and, um, and they weren't use, allowed to use that bathroom. They had to use the main bathroom. People are getting very creative. 
That's brilliant. Yeah. Okay, I remember that. The bathroom stand up. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, we usually say we, we usually say don't do conference calls in the bathroom, but we're changing uh, our mind about that. <laughs> well, I mean, my my coworker took his bread. He called it a bread. Uh, it's the slide out cutting board in his older yeah. home. I, I think it's called a bread t- a bread table, but I called it a cutting board. So I pulled it out, put his keyboard there, used his toaster to raise Smart. his raise his laptop to the right height and he literally he goes this is my workstation today i need to be apart from my kids and my wife and i just thought that was super creative that's awesome so i yeah excellent uh so here's another one another unique challenge is the internet bandwidth Mm -hmm. that due to people staying at home and tuning to online entertainment such as netflix etc uh, social media channels um, not available for online work how does an employee or leader work from home and uh, coaches family to limit <laughs> online usage. Any thoughts about that one? So this is a technical one. If you have a router that's capable, and most of them are, you just have to look at the instructions, you can actually limit the bandwidth on certain. So for instance, if you have a 5G and then uh, one that's level, late, uh, rated 5G, another one says uh, guest or something like that, you can move everyone on the guest and limit it at two megabits per second, and then you get a hundred or whatever the case may be. So you can actually look at the instructions and possibly regulate bandwidth that way. Um, Mm -hmm. The other thing is a lot of these devices, you can just tell them, hey, you can stream, but let's change all your YouTube settings to 480p instead of HD. You know, I think those are, there's a lot of things that you can do to regulate bandwidth. Uh, and, of course, upgrade your plan if necessary. Um, a lot of times even going for a cheap service that's $40 a month for a couple of months has <coughs> unlimited data may be more helpful to you if you have uh, bandwidth issues at home. Oh, yeah. The providers have already started sending those emails to people. Upgrade your plan. It's <laughs> a good well, idea. Some are giving, yeah, some are giving free data. Like, yeah. I think T-Mobile's giving free and limited. Verizon just said they're going to give 15 gigs of free data to people who are on fixed plans yeah. um, over the next couple of months. Yeah. Excellent. And the other thing I've heard is uh, some people are moving off the wireless router to a hard connect mm-hmm. to get mm-hmm. more stability. Yes, absolutely. So that's another get, alternative. Yeah, that's definitely better than trying to fight with 10 devices on one network. It's yes. just plugging in. You're going to get the best feed. Great. So, Asma, I see you've joined us. You have a question for us. Can you hear us, Asma? Yes. Can't hear oh. you. Yeah, I think your uh, audio is not working, unfortunately. We can't hear you. Maybe if you can uh, come back later, if we can get it working for you. Go ahead and say something now. It might be working. No? Okay. Uh, Maybe you can put your uh, co- comment in the chat uh, at this point. Yeah. And if you haven't bought stock in Zoom yet, do it now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, would love to hear also comment i personally don't like the camera because uh i work 12 hour days and the last thing i want to do is groom in the way i would have to in person i don't want to show myself in the hoodie and sweatshirt <laughs> I, I have heard that that a lot of folks are becoming more casual any thoughts on that um you know it, i mean many of you have worked from home for a long time uh, how, how do you deal with uh you know <laughs> looking professional feeling professional when you're working from home well, I, I knew somebody who, this was way before the internet, who was hunting for a job, and this was in the entertainment business. She was an executive, and she would get fully dressed up in her suit. For a phone call. And, and, well, <laughs> no, not even for a phone call, just to start her day. And she would go into yeah. the office at 8 o'clock in the morning, and she would come out at 5 o'clock at night, and she would completely dress up. And for her, psychologically, that was a power move. Uh, And it didn't matter that people couldn't see her. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I mean, you know, everybody has a different philosophy of how they want to present themselves. But uh, I'm always talking about being camera ready. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah, You know, uh, as you probably see, um, this is my usual, you know, corporate drag is is a button down shirt. And I I work from home and have for 20 years at this point. That's my ritual. Right. I'm I'm not going to wear T-shirts and hats i'm going to put on uh, something professional because it does change your attitude but uh, i'm at work and and uh, i'm i am presenting myself in a certain way 
as, as opposed to just uh, going native, right, and <laughs> being yeah. in your pajamas all day. So I think it is a state of mind and helps you with mindset, in my opinion. But yeah. uh, any other thoughts about that? I think Kevin made the point earlier about setting boundaries. Uh, and to your point, Terry, one of the other pitfalls in this environment is people just tend to work you know, 12 hour days. I'm not sure if this gentleman was doing 12 hour days before right. or if that's when it really started. Um, but you want to think about uh, having those boundaries. So just because you're working remote doesn't mean you have to be online working, you know, 24 um, seven. And sometimes it's that out of, I saw a funny meme the other day that said, I'm going to change my night pajamas to my day pajamas. <laughs> um, you know, because that's the value. But the other, the other element to consider is um, what's the culture of your organization, right? So some organizations, I have clients who are tech startups, that's their normal gig. They show up in sweaty, sweat uh, hoodies and sweatshirts and jeans, and, and that's fine. So in some instances, it may not matter much. Yeah. Um, but you also want to think about the boundaries piece and self-care and those kinds of things. <laughs> Yep. Great, great point. Okay, excellent. Um, let's see, we have uh, a few more questions. And, and anyone who would like to ask a question live and, and turn on their video, feel free to do that. And that'll be a signal that you would like to talk. Uh, oh my gosh. If anyone would, would like to do that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> any other? Lenny has an idea. Yeah. I just saw a couple of those. I was just reading Ed's comment, hilarious. My point earlier about making sure what you can see on your camera, someone sent him a file yesterday of a group call where one attendee's camera wasn't pointed correctly and revealed the person sitting in her underwear. Oops. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so, point so that should be, made. That should Thanks, be the rule, never underwear, right? <laughs> never underwear. <laughs> that was great. And always check your camera. Totally. In advance. <laughs> so, Laura, go yeah. ahead and talk. Hey, um, great, great tips about profession, dressing professional from the waist up. And for those of us who, like me today, don't really feel at my best. But I do want to make the point, and I, I think it was brought up earlier, too, that um, those are all important. And what I'm telling my clients is um, when they have team members who are uncomfortable being on video is, um, really bluntly, and I wouldn't say this to the client this way, but it's not just about them right now. Right. You know, it, um, we don't care what you look like necessarily. Right. We just need you. We need to see you. And um, so people on teams, I think um, just raising the level of awareness around that. Um, and yeah, of course, we need to be dressing a little professionally and understanding that this connectedness is um, partly due to being able to make some eye contact periodically. And I love Marianne's uh, strategy around, you know, three times in class, beginning, midway, and end. That's terrific, you know? And then it takes pressure off. But I just yeah. wanted to make that point um, that Thank it's you. not just about ourselves right now. Yeah, I totally agree. Thank and I'm you, going Laura. off a of video now. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. So, um, uh, go ahead. Oh, okay, uh, this is Lenny. Um, uh, I find it a little, um, I, I know Terry's got everybody uh, blo blocked, so you can't um, you, you can't see their faces. Start my video, okay? Here we go. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I found a couple of things. First of all, uh, when we first started teaching online, that was like on Moodle. Um, there was a there was a book came out called Work Naked. <laughs> it was basically, who cares what you look like? Right. It's all online at the time, and it, it, over the years, um, and that was and that was not video, by the way. It was just no, asynchronous. It was, yeah, it was asynchronous Moodle. Right. Okay. But the the interesting thing about both um, Zoom and first of all, I think Zoom's in some ways. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm sorry. I, 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 I couldn't get on till a little later, but my experience has been you need to be not over explicit, but very explicit. Or if you want to get a group going, or if you, if you want to get people engaged, you need to be you need to be very engaged yourself. You can't you, you almost have to compensate 
for the fact that everybody's in a little box in some <laughs> different part of the world. And, um, and also, I believe it's, it's, exhaust, it's more exhausting um, than if you were face to face. And I don't know exactly why, but I think that, that people seem to get tired earlier. So th that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it, but just that it really is helpful um, to, uh, to give them breaks and, and to do as many different kinds of things. I mean, I've been thinking about, oh, during the breaks, I'm going to put music on. Of course, I want to put 60s music on, which <laughs> they think I'm nuts, right? But do something, um, and I have a lot of cartoons. I use. This is for the online, for the Moodle. But, um, but the Zoom stuff is, um, uh, it's, ver it's very helpful um, for people. What's her name? Um, I love her uh, on MSNBC. The... Um, Rachel Maddow. Do you realize that Rachel Maddow's got a black jacket on, very elegant. Underneath, she's got jeans. And she's always said, I am never wearing anything on the bottom that isn't jeans. Good to see. Well, thank you, yeah. Lenny. Hey, I see Chris is on too. Chris, let's, let's hear your question and thought. Oh, but you're on mute, Chris. Let's see if we can. I'm going to unmute you. I have to click the unmute button. There we go. Uh, I'm here in my hoodie sweatshirt <laughs> and I just want to a uh, challenge and I'm sorry I um all right are you able to hear me yes yep. we hear you all right great uh, I was on my phone and uh, on video so I want to challenge something and I'd like perspective on this um, I've been following the dialogue around looking professional, turning on the video, you know, and, and, you know, making, making that happen, um, you know, for others, um, and not necessarily, you know, kind of getting over your own mental, um, challenges with looking professional, feeling professional and what you present to other people. And so, um, a thought just occurred to me that maybe in this environment, it's, okay to not always look professional and to have children in the background printing things and grabbing things off of the printer <laughs> and coming and just making appearances. Um, and maybe the, the lesson here is really that, you know, to, to go in and, and connect with the humanity and others and really share that I'm here I have the same challenges. I have the same issues. I have three young children who are, you know, popping in and out at all times, but I'm here and I'm, you know, and I'm physically and, you know, mentally doing my best just like everyone else um, on the call or in, in, in the chat room. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's happening, right? Yeah. We're seeing that happen and our acceptance of it is what's <laughs> going to be important right yeah. and also and you know finding that's that a, that's a culture change yeah right? right and this is a whole new world and what is acceptable and what's not i think is what needs to be defined right because you've got the other end of the spectrum that's inappropriate <laughs> and so <laughs> we're going to bump into that too right but somewhere in the middle of that is a new normal and i, and I love your comment about just yeah. being human because right now we all need to just be human yep. absolutely Absolutely. I, I think we're in a uh, unusual time, obviously, with a lot of change. Uh, so some some of these best practices might apply for long term folks who are yeah. going to be re re working remotely, f you know, for many years, and that's their standard operating procedure versus what we're dealing with right now, which is a huge amount of shift. So I think it's just uh, I think you make really good points, Chris. That giving everyone a little grace right now, yeah. just to sh just showing up, uh, is maybe what what we need to do uh, yeah. until we figure this all out. And the dialogue around it, Chris, is really what you're you're bringing up, which I think is great because that's what we need right now. It's just to communicate. Mm -hmm. What are the challenges? Yeah. One thing that. Uh, people kind of know me for it are my cats, which always visit during coaching sessions. <laughs> so, so that they, some, some of my clients say, where are the cats? I want to see yeah, right. the cats. 
So it, it has become a new normal for me Which to have, have cats on my lap. <laughs> there you go. Uh, T Terry, one question I have is, why did you block everyone's um, video? Was there a reason behind it? Yeah, for this, we're doing a panel discussion. Uh, and we're recording everyone, uh, so as opposed to a, a community meeting. So, so today was was not a community meeting format. But I wouldn't recommend blocking it or people turning off video uh, if if it was uh, an open uh, meeting. Uh, but uh, for panels, it gets a little bit distracting when you have people eating and <laughs> doing all kinds of things, uh, and then uh, the focus isn't on the speaker. Yeah. So I think context is really important on when you use video and how you use video. Uh, uh, so that that's that's a really good question uh, yep. uh, as well. Okay, and I, I have to run, Terry. I'm sorry. I have another webinar. Yeah, so we, we are at our ending point. So I just want to thank our panel today and all of our participants who uh, uh, came online and asked questions and added to the conversation. I do uh, want to thank uh, Marianne and Kevin and Sherry and just uh, give them a shout out for will their willingness to come and share their experiences as people who have done this for a long time, right, and bring some best practices to the, the rest of us who uh, may be uh, starting to do this in a new way. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. It was nice to meet everybody. Thank you. And I have a few announcements uh, before we uh, hang up. Uh, and uh, and th that the main one is if you haven't yet joined our community of practice, uh, which is our opportunity to share information and resources, and this video will be uh, obviously posted on the community of practice, you can go to this webpage, which is ccop.fielding.edu. Again, ccop.fielding.edu. Um, this is at the end uh, of this description. You can click on the subscribe button and stay in touch with us long term. You do not need to be uh, a fielding alum or student. Uh, anyone in the world is welcome to join. Um, we also have a blog and uh, you can see here today's webinar and, and uh, Sherry uh, and wrote a, a very nice blog. So if you haven't yet read it, I highly recommend you go back and take a look at that. Um, all of our blogs are available uh, from our main website, which is fielding.edu forward slash blog. You can see some upcoming webinars, which we invite you all to attend as well. Uh, the next one is actually next Wednesday evening. And uh, we have Brian Underhill. He'll be speaking on um, uh, executive coaching trends, what you need to know. Uh, Brian is the uh, founder and CEO of CoachSource, which is the largest uh, global network of executive coaches. Uh, and he does a research study every other year, and he'll be talking about his research uh, and talking about what's happening in executive coaching right now. So highly recommend you tune in and, and watch Brian. Uh, that's available again uh, next Wednesday, April 1st, from 4 to 5 Pacific. Uh, and then you can see all of our upcoming webinars uh, that uh, we highly recommend. There's also one this weekend on uh, Saturday, <laughs> which will be, I think very interesting uh, uh, research study as well as tool uh, where you can understand coaching readiness. Uh, so we have a special guest speaker, Dr. Jody Odell. Uh, she's speaking on Saturday morning from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Pacific uh, on measuring mindset and change readiness in a coaching context. Uh, so she's a dynamic speaker and uh, we'll be talking about tools that she has to measure mindset and change. So stay tuned for all our upcoming webinars. And we invite you also to join us on Basecamp uh, by joining the coaching community of practice. Uh, lastly, if you're interested in coach training yourself, uh, you can go to coach.fielding.edu uh, and learn about all things coaching. Fielding offers um, coach training programs or ICF credentialed. Uh, so you can read about those at coach.fielding.edu. Our deadline for applications for May is April 1st, so you still have about a week to get your application in if you're thinking about investing in yourself in uh, gaining coaching skills like uh, our speakers have today. So again, thank you all for coming, and we look forward to having you on another call either Saturday or next week um, or one of those in the future. Uh, feel free to reach out if anyone needs anything as well. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Terry. Jerry. Bye, everybody. Bye for now.